Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today. Uh, we will be talking about Drupal migration. Uh, my name is Olya. I am project manager at Evolving Web, and I, ha I have a lot of experience uh, with the migration project. And alongside my colleagues, Pierre Paul. Hi. So I'm one of the team lead at uh, Evolving Web. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the technical stuff. And Jesse. Yes, good morning. Uh, so my name is Jesse. I'm a solutions architect uh, at Evolving Web. Um, so I'm going to talk us through some of our migration uh, projects. Uh, we also have uh, Martin, who you've all already seen once this morning. Uh, he's going to be joining us in a few minutes. He's from Acquia. Uh, he's currently recording a podcast. So hopefully we're not too loud. Um, but uh, yeah. In our session today, we will take you through the key steps of Drupal migration project, both from project management and development perspective. Uh, walking through the real world experience, we will share everything from the initial site assessment and models check to the intricates to the discovery process and actually data migration details. Uh, we will also introduce you to the open source Acquia Migrate Accelerate tool and we will share with you uh, final steps that you need to consider before go live. Uh, we will also highlight some challenging elements and the crucial lessons we have learned through hands-on experience. All right. Um, and um, yeah, here are the overview of the clients that we worked with. Um, so which is uh, Yukon government, INSVQ, Institut National du Santé, um, du Santé Public du Québec, uh, BenQ, um, Bibliothèque Nationale uh, du Québec, <laughs> and also Royal Ontario Museum, um, Prince Edward Island Government, and uh, Ontario Security Commissions, and more others. <laughs> um, so please raise your hands who uh, who works with Drupal 7? Oh, wow. There are some of them. Good. So actually 50% of, uh, of the Drupal websites are still on Drupal 7. And um, it's important to mention, and a lot of you might know that Drupal.org officially announced that uh, Drupal 7 will reach its end in January 5th, 2025. And great news to those of the websites that are still on Drupal 7, right? You still have some time. <laughs> okay, but it's actually like, um, like this milestone emphasized the urgency of migrating from Drupal 7 to the newer ver version, which is Drupal, uh, Drupal 10. Um, Okay, so what are the differences between Drupal 7 actually, uh, between migration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 and Drupal 8 and 9 to Drupal, to Drupal 10? So migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 is considered to be more complex due to major architectural uh, changes. They need to rewrite the custom code. Um, yeah, um, dependency on updated model, community models, team conversions, and extensive testing for data integrity. And uh, migrating from Drupal 8 to Dru and Drupal 9 to Drupal 10 considered to be less complex because it's already incorporated all of these major architectural changes, um, which is integration with Symfony framework and modern uh, PHP practices that makes this transition more smoother and uh, less complicated. Okay, so what are the types of migrations? All right, I'm going to talk through a couple of, of the different types of migrations that we really see and handle. Uh, we thought it was just important to do that before we get really too deep into you know the actual migration information and how, how we handle that. Uh, so uh, first off, I want to talk a little about manual migrations. So um, Olya, Olya mentioned uh, BenQ that we worked on. Uh, they had an aging site that was starting to, you know, show its age a little bit. Uh, it was built on another CMS, .CMS. Um, so they knew that they had a chance to 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 uh, migrate to something new. Um, and even before they they chose chose Drupal, they knew that this was going to be a big job. 
uh, lots of content restructuring uh, with a different content model. They have built out a completely new design system, um, which you're going to see some of that in a moment. Uh, they knew that they wanted something that's going to help their content editing team. Um, and so really what that ended up meaning uh, was that um, with needing to build this new platform that's going to you know, serve uh, the province of Quebec for, for a long time, uh, that's also going to help with, with uh, keeping their, their content duplication efforts through integrating with um, some of their external uh, systems that they have internally. Um, they knew that all this was going to uh, be, a, be a, a, you know, a big job. Um, but they also knew that, that keeping the legacy content around uh, you know, wasn't something that they wanted to do. There's a whole bunch of problems with, with a lot of that. So, so really looking at like a, an automated migration wasn't uh, really going to be the, the, the best way. Um, so, so yeah, with all that in mind, the needing for a content refresh, a new modern platform, uh, they knew that the, the manual migration was going to be the, the, the way to go. Um, so uh, that didn't really mean like a simple copy and paste. Uh, what it ended up meaning was having to, you know, uh, um, uh, rebuild, restructure, update a lot of content. Uh, so we worked with their team to prioritize uh, the content types that they would need and the areas of the site that they would need first, uh, so that we could then work on developing that out, uh, building out that design system, uh, while their team focused on rewriting, prepping the content, and ultimately getting it into Layout Builder as we started to, to, to build out those different content types in different sections of the, of the new site. Uh, that being said, uh, on the other hand, there's some other sites uh, like um, ENSPQ we worked on. Uh, we actually were able to do a lot of, of automated migration for that. Uh, so in this case, it was actually a Drupal 7 uh, to Drupal 9 at the time uh, migration. Um, and they really just wanted like a straightforward migration. They, needed, they knew this upcoming you know, deadline. This was already uh, a little while ago now. They knew this was, 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 was needed. Um, they wanted to just get to that, that, that new platform. Um, us knowing that we are looking at a fairly significant rebuild, we also suggested and talked to them about the idea of doing a design refresh at the same time. Um, they were pretty excited about that. So, but speaking about the, the migration, we knew that we had about 30,000 plus pages in that Drupal 7 instance that we needed to get over. It's a big job. Uh, so we looked at it all and figured out, uh, you know, review the content and the structure and, and the, the, the best practices that were in place and ended up deciding that we could do an automated migration of all that. Uh, so that's the, sort of the other, the other big way to do that. Um, and in the end, we saved a ton of time uh, by automating all of this, not having to do manual content entry of 30,000 plus uh, different pages. Uh, so that said, uh, I don't want to suggest that it's possible to automatically ma migrate everything in all cases. Um, in most cases, that is actually a, a need for, um, uh, uh, especially when we're doing a new design like this, we start to look at needing probably some more of a hybrid approach where because we're doing a refresh of the home page, some new views are involved. Uh, there's a lot of, of other work that's around the content. Uh, so in the end, what we often end up doing is pretty common is more of a hybrid approach. We're migrating content automatically as we can, but we're also rebuilding some, some content in a more manual way when we need to. how to prepare for the migration project. Um, from the very beginning, it's crucial for project management uh, manager to engage it through planning and execution with the particular emphasis on the close collaboration with the staff lead and key stakeholders. This collaborative and structural approach will boost chances uh, for the successful uh, Drupal migration project. Um, moreover, project manager should consider and undertake the following steps. Uh, first one, which is comprehensive site evaluation. With the help of the tech lead, assess the current website in terms of uh, content, content structure and functionality. Uh, understand the dependencies and customizations in place. Uh, you will need to review model availability, comp uh, compatibility, and alternative solution if there are, if there are any. Um, stakeholders alignment. Engage with the tech lead and stakeholders early to set up clear expectation goals and understand any specific requirements or consideration. Um, scope definition. Um, accurately define the project scope. It's very, very important to do this early in the project, uh, in the discovery phase. 
uh, before moving into actual uh, migration process. Timeline uh, and milestone planning. Establish a realistic timeline with the milestones. This helps in tracking progress and ensure that the project stays on, um, on schedule. Risk assessment, I didn't like really important risk, <laughs> risk assessment, identify potential risks that may arise during your uh, migration project, which, which can be uh, adoption of the new CMS by your team, uh, performance issue, models cap compatibility, et cetera. And yeah, and develop contingency plan uh, if it's possible. Um, communication plan, yeah, develop a robust communication plan to facilitate regular updates and uh, uh, feedback loops um, uh, and effective and that will and this will ensure effective coordination and communication between your team and key stakeholders. Um, work with the tech lead to ensure that the data is backed up and the rollback plan um, is set. Um, implementing security measures to safeguard um, data during the migration process. Um, testing, very important thing is testing. Um, ensure that the testing plan um, is in place. This doesn't mean that stakeholders need to test all of the functionality at the end of the project in the UAT phase, which is uh, user acceptance testing. Ensure that you have the, you give the ability for the client to test the functionality after the delivery of each bucket of work. Um, this will help you um, to engage early with the stakeholders to gather their feedback early and accommodate any of the issue and question they had. Um, documentation. Ensure that all the plans, decision, and all of the changes are well documented and accessible to all of the relevant parties. And let me show you the example of part of the documentation we did in the discovery process for the Yukon government client. For the Yukon government client, we did um, the hardest one, Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 migration. Um, based on the experience we've had with the Yukon government, we understood that documentation plays a huge role in the migration project, especially um, in the beginning. Uh, the proper assessment of the website and thorough discovery phase makes the development and testing processes uh, well set up and clear for every member of the team and the stakeholders. Uh, in fact, uh, documentation for the stakeholders doesn't necessarily include only thorough analysis of all of the content types, taxonomies, theming, use, and models, but the uh, clear plan of each bucket of work, their statuses, their clear milestone um, in order to deliver the project on time and make this transition smoothly. Um, okay. Here is a bit of the documentation on contrib models and custom code analysis. So here on the left, you can see the list of all of the contrib models, um, their area, which can be admin, map, content architecture, um, their upgrade availability, actions that is discussed with the team and aligned with the team and their status of uh, statuses, of course, and custom code analysis uh, does describe um, all of the details, and um, yeah, you can see some of the some of the details on the screen and their statuses, and all of this is incorporated into one main giant table uh, with the statuses and planning of the milestones. All right. Um, so let's move to the technical discovery. Yeah, so let's talk about the technical discovery process. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the big migration project. So maybe you're coming from, sorry, <laughs> maybe you're coming from uh, from a different CMS than Drupal Seven, but it's going to be it's going to be pretty much the same process for the dis discovery. So, um, like Jesse said, uh, Drupal Nine to Drupal Ten is closer to an upgrade process than a migration process. So for a big migration process like Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 or that CMS in case of thank you, um, the most important step is gonna be the inventory. So we're gonna take what you have right now and we're gonna put labels everywhere on all your content types that you have. Um, you, we're gonna talk about your module install or not. Maybe you're 
they're, they're just installed and not enabled. We're gonna try to flag all content types that you have because I think everybody at some point created a content type named test just to test few things and they never deleted uh, the, the content type uh, afterward. And there's always a, a few a few module uh, left left around just uh, just for testing purposes. Um, so so that's going to be the big the big inventory. So we're going to do an inventory of uh, everything that you have, and make sure that we're we're going to make up some big cleaning up. Um, aside that, we're also going to be putting some numbers next to them. Uh, we want to know which content type are going to be uh, are being used right now in, into your organization. Make, making sure that uh, the ones that are not being used, maybe they could be merged into something else, or maybe just removed. We want to make sure we also document the, the, the relationship between those, uh, because as we clean up stuff, remove stuff, we want to keep those relationships. Like for example, if you have a, a, a blog post content type and you have a link to uh, some author uh, content types, if we remove the, the author content type, the blog post needs to be updated maybe by linking to real users or something like that. And at some point, we're gonna be talking also about your sitemap, your page structure, but this goes more into uh, the strategy side and less into the technical discovery. I just want to point out also that we need to document the, the vocabulary and taxonomies that you're currently using. So we want to migrate those as much as possible uh, because it's part of the relationship with, uh, with your content. Um, so yeah, so in, in some case, um, a few things will need to be migrated manually, uh, at least some, uh, until somebody comes up with an AI that does this for you. But um, for, for the views and the custom module, there there's some tools that gonna help you to migrate automatically, but there's always uh, gonna be some human interaction that are gonna be uh, helping, <laughs> that are gonna be needed for, for migrating to the full time. Um, so the views, the custom module, the block, uh, most of the time, I'm not gonna say all the time, but most of the time are gonna be migrated manually uh, because we want to make sure it's still relevant. But the content can be uh, most of the time migrated automatically and updated automatically. So it doesn't mean that uh, you have to go into a long period of content freeze. Uh, since the process is, uh, is uh, automated, it's, it's just gonna be run uh, every maybe every week uh, to make sure we have the new content as well. So yeah, so the importance of discovery, this is gonna be your big plan for, for the big migration project. So um, don't skip this. Take the time you need. Um, you're gonna have less surprises uh, along the road. You're gonna be able to define a better scope for the project and a better budget um, as well. Um, so I think I said it uh, a few times already, but the cleanup is really important. Uh, the stuff that you don't migrate, that means you don't have to queue it. <laughs> I think it, it's, uh, it goes without saying. Um, there's a few things to think about as well. Uh, like for an SPQ, there was, um, some uh, web application that was embedded in one of the page uh, that was given by the government of Quebec uh, to track the, the expenses. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that we often forget because this works all the time and nobody has to touch it. Uh, but this is this is something we also need to migrate into your new new site. As for the bad uh, views, I'm not going to give any any name, <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of projects that create views per tax in turn because they want to custom display just for those instead of thinking of a more general view, uh, general general view that's going to be handling all the tax and returns. But the bad views, uh, this is something that you want to take care of as much as you can before migrating because you don't want to migrate the uh, bad views uh, in the process. The CK Editor plugin is one of the things you also need to think about if you have custom plugins or you, something that may, may may not be standard into the CK Editor world. Uh, this is you're going to have to think about it. Uh, con content with styling markup is one of the big issues I uh, also had uh, with the ENSPQ. So they add CSS embedded into the content. This is something you can also automate when you migrate and you can clean up the, your, your content as well. Um, so. All right, so you've done all the planning, you're ready to go, it's time to start developing the new site. Um, that's kind of the easy part, right? When we're talking about content migrations, it's developing the site is, is okay, that's, that's, that's easy. Uh, if, anyone, if, if, if there's any help that's needed, I think we know some people that know how to do that. Um, but let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about how we can make migrations a little bit easier. So that's where Martin's going to tell us about some some new uh, open source uh, tools. Thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some tools that we can use to make that migration process 
a little bit easier. Um, maybe before we dive right into the tools themselves, let's talk a little bit about kind of that migration process. So at Acquia, we've worked with lots of different customers through these kinds of migration processes. And this is roughly what we see as kind of the breakdown. So lots of, you know, probably one of the biggest chunks is that upfront analysis and planning that we've already talked about. Um, the sort of content migration and data import, uh, also a pretty significant part. And then the business logic and presentation, really about half the effort, really a lot of that is sort of porting over, again, like custom uh, modules that are going to comprise that um, business logic, uh, your custom theme, that's that's really your presentation layer. And so what we developed is something called Acquia Migrate Accelerate as really kind of an automation layer that can sit on top of the Migrate API that's in Drupal core. Uh, what that's going to do is, is provide an interface that's much more sort of intuitive uh, so that less technical users can really help to drive that migration process. So instead of it having to be sort of a tech lead that's writing, you know, migration scripts by hand, uh, it provides a nice UI that's intuitive enough that even like maybe a project manager could, could do a lot of the work. And so hopefully what that process looks like in terms of how it transforms the process is makes the analysis and planning uh, much shorter. Uh, data import can be, you know, potentially reduced by, you know, 80% uh, even, uh, again, through the, the automation. And then what we would say is using a variety of other tools uh, can really help with sort of uh, porting over, again, that, that more custom code around the business logic and the presentation. So using tools like Acquia Site Studio, potentially things like our cloud IDEs, but also definitely working with trusted partners as well. So let's start, talk a little bit more about Migrate Accelerate and some of the features that it provides. So definitely uh, that enhanced UI that we've talked about, it provides its own troubleshooting interface to, to give those, um, you know, whoever's working on configuring that migration some, uh, you know, better information around where the exceptions are. And then it also has sort of a robust uh, module recommendation engine. So in terms of the UI, uh, what it provides here is sort of a, a very interactive, uh, sort of hybrid React interface that in real time is going to provide a lot of data around what's being migrated, how many errors have been encountered. Um, and then as the person sort of running this migration, you don't have to wait for the entire migration to be finished running before you can start to dig in and understand how that migration is working. So you can look at an individual piece of content that's already been migrated sort of look at that mapping from, you know, source to des destination and even open up a preview to sort of get a rough sense of, of how that looks. And so that can give you some quick, very quick validation in terms of how that migration process is working for you. Uh, in terms of troubleshooting, it's also going to give you sort of a detailed log so you can, again, see where the exceptions are and, and understand are there ways that I need to maybe uh, configure the migration in a little bit more sophisticated way or maybe add some, some uh, special code to, to handle some of these exceptions. And then finally, it actually has built into it a whole database of mappings from sort of legacy Drupal 7 modules to uh, modern Drupal equivalents so that as you start to go through that planning process, it's gonna be able to spit out a list of recommendations based on the modules that are already in use on your Drupal 7 site and recommend the, the equivalents in sort of uh, modern Drupal. So you know, from a planning perspective, that can be really powerful. And it will also sort of call out what are the ones that don't have a modern equivalent. And so you can start to do some planning around, you know, do we still need that functionality? Maybe it's something we can just drop. Maybe we need to look at something custom, or maybe there's something like ECA that we can use to sort of provide custom functionality, but through configuration. Uh, so the great news is that actually a couple of months ago, uh, we made uh, Migrate Accelerate open source. So you don't have to be an Acquay customer to be able to use this tool. There is a, a link here if you want to use the, uh, the QR code for dev.acquia.com. There's a tutorial by Wim Lears, who is sort of the technical lead on that project, walks through in a more detailed way how Migrate Accelerate, Accelerate works and talks about some of the benefits of it being open source as well. So definitely worth a read if it's a tool that you're interested in. So uh, there was that sort of um, custom set of code that we talked about um, and some of the ways that that, that can be ported over. Uh, but also wanted to talk about sort of a newer technology that potentially could be really helpful for that sort of more custom code as well. So this is a new project. It was uh, released earlier this year called Retrofit, and it's really sort of a backwards compatibility layer for Drupal. So the idea being that um, you're still going to want to ultimately 
eventually update that legacy code to sort of, you know, adopt modern coding standards. It's going to be more performant if it's written in sort of modern PHP. Um, but from a migration standpoint, potentially it allows you to, to maybe space that work over a longer period of time. So we know that, uh, you know, Drupal end of life for uh, Drupal 7 is coming in January 2025, but maybe if you could keep using that custom theme until later in 2025, that gives your team a little more breathing room. And so that's where something like this potentially is useful. It may not work for all use cases. It's probably still going to require some refactoring of your code. Um, but something to, to sort of, you know, maybe talk to your team or your partner to, to understand if this could, could at least help with that migration process. And so if you want to learn more about Drupal Retrofit, there are actually a couple of podcasts where uh, Matt Glayman, the uh, creator, actually talks in, in a lot more detail about the tool and how it works. Uh, so definitely, again, something to um, explore more if it's of interest. Okay, great. So yeah, so, oh. We still want to talk a little bit more about how uh, after the migration is 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 finished, because um, it's actually not quite done yet. Um, you know, we've we've ported everything over, the content's in a new spot. Um, we're ready for the next steps, right? Uh, well, what is that next steps? Um, so we've we've run the migration. We're next going to do some testing, making sure it's all come over correctly, uh, and then it's time for uh, UAT, like uh, Ola mentioned earlier. Um, and that's that's kind of it, right? We do that testing. Everything's good. Everything's golden. Uh, and then it's and then it's uh, it's time for for, for launch. Um, well, in reality, usually there's more of an iterate phase in there where we'll do some tweaks. We'll fix maybe some 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 challenges that we come across, uh, and then we'll we'll be able to to finally now uh, say that we're we're ready to go. We validated those changes, and the the migration's all all, all ready to go. Um, but that. You know, there's still then so we send it to 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 our, our our partners with our with with NSVQ in this case, and they've done some more looking, and they have the the real content experts, so they're going to find probably some some more things that that need some little adjustments here and there to make sure that that content is all migrated over uh, and ready to go. So there's there's definitely that 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 process that's involved. It's not just a simple one click. Um, although we're definitely getting there, um, uh, and then it's done. You know, there's there's sort of that. That, that process where we have to do some get some testing in there as well. And so what are we looking at when we're testing? Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, I could have gone on and on about all the different things that, that, that we're looking for. Uh, but I mean, in reality, we're making sure that all the content is all coming over, including images and files. Uh, the translations are all working as we need to. Uh, references are in place. Any transformations that maybe we did to maybe extract some data or change some data. Um, layout and visual things. Uh, you know, there's some things that might not. Maybe we have some some issues with how things are laying out in the new in the new site. Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of things that we can continue to go into. But really, there's this is just underscoring that importance of of testing. And when we're dealing with a site that has potentially thirty thousand or more different uh, uh, pages, we're not always going to be able to do that all manually. That's that's a lot of content. Um, so we're going to turn to some automation tools. One that we uh, use, we, we, we built and open sourced a tool called SiteDiff. Uh, it does a whole bunch of things, but we use it to specifically to compare like uh, the before and after of a content area, of the actual body content, and maybe some metadata. Uh, and it's a quick way to crawl through a lot of content all at once and just make sure that it's, it's you know, looking as we expect it to afterwards. And then we're going to get into UAT. So what kind of things are we looking for here? Just some, some quick tips about you know, the, the success criteria. There's something that uh, we've mentioned a couple of times, and it's really important to think about that in that uh, initial discovery phases and the planning phases, making sure that we're sort of, we know what, what we're looking for. Uh, then there's the validation of, of some of the high, uh, important and high traffic pages. Um, those ones, you know, those those really important landing pages that maybe are, are are part of an event or something, they need to be they definitely need to be validated and checked. Uh, and then spot checking the actual content itself. Some of those thirty thousand, that's where you have to really work together with uh, collaborate with the team to figure out what are those pages that really need to be checked. What are the the the, the unique ones that use certain uh, features or or uh, get you a good sample size of all the different pages uh, from all the different content types. So just get to get into some lessons learned now. 
Yeah, uh, spend more time on the discovery process and this initial uh, website assessment. Um, don't underestimate uh, this in the very beginning of the project before demonstration. Um, yeah, and ensure close involvement of the Tahoe and key stakeholders because your stakeholders will be the one who will be accepting your work at the end. So set up those successful criteria in the very beginning to make sure your um, Drupal 10 migration project is successful. And for as much as we try, we almost always have to have some sort of a content freeze. Uh, it is pretty much always required. Uh, but with proper planning, we can always work to, to minimize it. Um, and a part of that is uh, one of the, the, the key things that we've learned in some of our projects is where we can and where it makes sense. Um, when we're dealing with some, some data that might be a bit messy, it might make sense just to fix it at the, at the source. Uh, and then, um, you know, as Pierre Paul mentioned earlier too, we can avoid having to QA it later uh, if we can fix it in the in the source. It doesn't always it's not always possible, and it doesn't always make sense. But in some cases, it will it will help to speed up uh, reruns of of migration content and and reduce that content freeze as well. So just a few last quick takeaways. Uh, just want to underscore that importance of the of the preparation. I think we've we've commented on that a couple of times. I hope I hope it's uh, it's it's you know, we we've. We've uh, made that, that pretty clear. Um, we've learned that time and time again that but as we, in our discovery, we uncover something uh, that we didn't expect, and it could have been a big problem later on, but because we caught it early early on, uh, we can take the time to address it while we're looking through the rest of, of, the, of the planning and, and, and work. Uh, collaboration, uh, transparency, sharing the knowledge with the team, uh, communicating anything that comes up really early, and working together on that UAT. Uh, and then the, the community, we have all these new tools coming out, um, all these different, you know, all this different content, blog posts, new uh, rules for, um, for, for, for how to handle certain issues, new modules coming up that might help to fix some backwards compatibility issues. So uh, go, always going back to that community is, uh, is really good. But, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's so much more to it. We can't really summarize it that quickly, but those are just a couple of, of quick key takeaways. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you for listening, and we're open to some questions. Any question? We yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think I think somebody's running for the mic. Oh, you need my mic. Perfect. Thank you. We've got a bit of time before lunch is ready, so we have uh, we have time for questions. Great presentation, by the way. Um, in terms of the content migration, can one of you speak to how you layer uh, data on top of the content inventory in order to prioritize the content during a migration, especially one with 30,000 pages? I'm sure Google Analytics is involved, but I was just curious on how the approach is is taken there. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I was distracted. I, I missed the question. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so can one of you speak to how you layer data analysis on top of the content inventory in order to prioritize content during the migration so you're not spending a lot of time on pages that are getting, you know, one view over the last two years or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we address this in two ways. Uh, one is to uh, try to identify as much as possible the, the stakeholder at the beginning of the project. Uh, so when you come down with the content types and the number of nodes attached to each content type uh, you're gonna come you, you're gonna go to the stakeholders and talk about those those content types and if they need to be deleted or if they need to be moved so the stakeholders are going to be the one taking the decision of what to do with the content itself does that answer your question yeah yeah it does okay. i just i just think it's important for everyone to know that you should really look at the performance of your content before doing a migration because it just might not be necessary to bring that over yeah thanks um Uh, I have two questions. The first one is about the Migrate Accelerator. It is between uh, 7 and 9. It doesn't work on the, on the 10? So th that's correct. It, it currently works from 7 to 9, but typically the the work of going from 9 to 10 is, is going to be significantly less. So um, 
That being said, it, it is open source. So, you know, anybody who wants to contribute to the work of getting it to work directly to 10, you know, uh, you know, you can go through the sort of standard contribution for us process of submitting patches and so on. Thank you. And the second question is about the Drupal 11. It is expected to be in August 24. Uh, it, do we expect that we have to put another project to, to migrate between the 10 and the 11? So I would say at this point, it looks like the the number of changes that are gonna be incorporated in Drupal 11 are probably gonna be even more modest than going from nine to 10. I think the one that was the most disruptive, I would say from going to nine to 10 was really the, the change in CK editor. And we're not looking at anything, I think, you know, that's as likely to introduce challenges. So I would, at, at this point, I'm hopeful that that 10 to 11 should be much smoother but you know, we'll see what they, they come up with between now and August. Thank you very much. Yeah. But 11 is gonna be great. There's a lot of uh, improvement on the UX and uh, even for the content is good, that's, uh, that's gonna be great. And I think the plan day, date is June, maybe August. Okay, August now, <laughs> sorry. Um, anybody else has any question or maybe success story about their migration or horror story? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was great. Uh, when we talk about always moving forward, right? Let's say Drupal 7 to 10 or 7 to 11 in the future, but uh, we should also think about what happens when something goes wrong, when we have to migrate back. So um, let's say we migrated to Drupal 10 and we find some issues. What would be your plan to go back? Or what would be the contingency plan? That's what is my question. Yeah, in the case for BenQ, I can talk for BenQ at least, um, they kept the uh, the dust CMS around. So there there was some content that they didn't have time to migrate to in, in the schedule that we had planned. Uh, so people will switch from the old site to the new site whenever they click on the menu. So the home page would take you back to the Drupal site, but if you go into the uh, legislative uh, pages, you, you would be brought back to the, the dust CMS page. So it's a way to mitigate the, the risk of maybe having one exception that's ready for, for the full, full launch. And this is how we do migration, but I think Albert uh, did a session at the last Evolve Drupal in Montreal about a different way of doing things. Uh, so you may want to talk to him afterward as well. Any success story or, or stories that you want to share? And also we will have lunch soon, so you are welcome to Come to us and ask any question you might have about uh, open source, Acquia Microt Accelerate, or, or about any migration question you have. Thank you so much. Wait, wait, I have a, I have a thing. Oh, Hi. okay. Sorry, Sorry. I'm <laughs> behind the column. Um, th thanks for, for the great presentation. At, uh, at Evolving Web, we've, we've done a lot of Drupal 7 to 8, 9, and, and 10 migrations. And uh, one, of, one of the things that I think people find surprising is, um, the full rebuild aspect of this is sometimes harder to, migra to, to migrate a, a Drupal 7 site to a Drupal 8 site that looks exactly the same as, uh, as it used to. I mean, it's, I don't know if folks here have, have ma made similar attempts, but, uh, but we find that it's, it's important not just to do discovery, but also to consider a redesign. Um, jo Josh mentioned that there should be a content audit to see what is worth keeping, and of course a feature audit. But, but simply, uh, if, if you had a website up for seven years and uh, your development team tells you that uh, whether it looks more modern and fresh or whether it looks like picture perfect, pixel perfect, exactly the same will cost roughly, roughly the same, uh, you should probably consider a redesign. Um, and sometimes we've, I've even had to argue with, with clients indirectly uh, saying, please make it look like it's not from 1999. Uh, I was actually wondering, uh, has anyone here had has similar stories about whether they did an upgrade in place and if there was a redesign at the same time or or if it was really a lift and shift conceptually? I have a, a bit of a different take on, uh, on that. I found that uh, during the discovery phase with one of the clients I was doing a really big migration of, um, it just felt overwhelming to do the design and the, the or the redesign rather and the migration at the same time. So we had a different experience uh, in Evolving Web. So we decided to really do, to migrate everything indiscriminately. And then later on piecemeal to start 
doing, uh, to start doing redesigns of certain components. So obviously that's gonna be decided at the uh, discovery phase, but there's, uh, there's, you know, that's a different take on that, uh, on that uh, weather. So it's not always a good idea to have a redesign. Sometimes it might be a good idea to go really pixel perfect. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to add uh, for that in like uh, for the INSPQ, uh, we didn't do the redesign of the whole website, of course, but we did at least the most important pages, which is homepage or more important components that they uh, that they use uh, throughout all of the website. So it's kind of the hybrid approach. And um, yeah, any of the client can consider this as well.